Hello friends and family, and welcome to our boring meditation stuff for Tuesday, September 29th. Over this past weekend, I finally finished uh, Poor Economics. Um, and I have to say that personally, I feel like that's an appropriate title. Um, I didn't enjoy the book very much. and. I think part of the reason is because on many levels, economics as a science feels much more of a pseudoscience even than something like psychology. Um, there are a lot of made up models and goofy slogans and things that don't really correspond to anything that you would normally find in the natural sciences. Um, but beyond that, I do honestly believe it is a poor economics, which leaves no space for our own humanity. And all the arguments presented in the book, even those um, ostensibly presented as humanitarian or altruistic or moral or compassionate, um, are framed in terms of uh, of wealth generation and growth and um, you know the the fundamental metrics of the present global um, capitalist economy. There's nothing wrong with that economy. It functions, it's perfectly fine. Um, but it's very strange to me to drag everything else into this one unified model, especially when as a unified model, it's so incredibly bad. <laughs> so it's one thing to drag everything into the model of physics or everything into the model of chemistry. And you can do that. Um, but economics, it's a really flawed system for that sort of thinking. And um, I think that when you go out of your way to force that, to push compassion into a model constrained by finance, that you lose a lot. Um, and what's interesting about this is that intellectually we have a lot of difficulty with these sorts of concepts we have a lot of difficulty with the idea of compassion ethics morality the way that we live our lives the choices we make, it's often tempting to try to find some sort of mathematical model that we can apply to those things. We can say, oh, okay, this criminal deserves N years in jail, but this criminal deserves M years in jail and a fine <laughs> and the death penalty, right? We we try to quantify everything and there is a need for that i mean you can't really have a penal system without quantifying the crimes of other humans um, but collectively and more important individually our capacity for compassion is really difficult to drag into the numerical world, to drag into the material world um, from the outside, uh, from a perspective of intellectualizing or perhaps over-intellectualizing those things. What's funny is that this can be done from the inside. And these <clears throat> two or arguably three meditation techniques that I'm uh, cheerleading? I don't know what I'm doing in these videos. Um, 
that anapana meditation and vipassana meditation have this particular quality at their core which is somewhat uh, ironic maybe and that quality is that they are um, painfully material there is nothing imaginative there is nothing creative there is nothing um, outside yourself to engage in these meditations they are the most materialistic meditations possible um, the material of your body and in the case of anapana meditation the material of your breath and these are very simple things and they also seem like they seem like hopelessly mundane things uh, at the gross level if we sort of examine our own body and we say oh okay yeah it seems like one piece I mean I know it's not I know my knee and my elbow are different um, and then if I lost an arm the rest of me would still be here I would still have a consciousness um, though the, the the extent the horizons of that consciousness are debatable if I lose if I lose an arm or if I am paralyzed more so but I mean that's another conversation entirely but there's nothing really mystical there's nothing magical there's nothing supernatural about our own body and so if we meditate on it um, it it seems rather unromantic and to meditate on the material and somehow find that oh now when we look at the outside world we see we see reason for hope we see reason for optimism we see reason to have compassion for other people and that compassion comes in a number of flavors that maybe we're not accustomed to um, so obviously I think a normal person <laughs> not an economist um, that a normal person feels compassion for the poor in and of itself without needing a materialistic model to back it up without needing a, uh, an in argument which involves the the inflation of the GDP or um, growth for the whole country simply that the act of helping someone less fortunate is in and of itself worthwhile um, I think most people agree with that uh, it's weird to me that a lot of the arguments in this book <clears throat> seem to be made in a context where presumably some of the readers don't feel that way <laughs> that oh poor people they only deserve to be helped if there's some numerical reason for doing so some grand um, calculation that we can perform that says yes this is a quantifiably good thing but um, there are these classic stories right from every culture um, where I'm from the story is a Christmas Carol right that's kind of the the classic go-to um, helping others for the sake of helping others oh and then it leads to this virtuous circle um, kind of story um, I've been advocating to a few friends recently actually um, in no small part because of their anxiety uh, surrounding the pandemic that they read Winnie the Pooh I actually think that the the Disney purchase of the franchise of Winnie the Pooh did a lot of damage because now people who otherwise might stumble across Winnie the Pooh um, assume that Winnie the Pooh is a Disney creation <laughs> and uh, not that the original two books were such um, magnificent pieces of art but there's a story in Winnie the Pooh as well I realize this is also coming from the Western world but um, there's a story in Winnie the Pooh where uh, Piglet loses his house the background to that is not really important but 
um, it's tragic. Piglet loses his house, and um, he needs a place to stay. And so Pooh offers to him a place to stay. And this is this is not exactly like helping the poor. This is not exactly like lifting up the less fortunate. But um, it is the same sort of compassion that Pooh shows Piglet that we show that we show the poor when we donate or when we donate our time or if we give money to uh, one of these um, of, uh, small financing schemes uh, which are present in in level one and level two countries um, for people running small businesses um, it comes up a lot in the book. <laughs> um, it's interesting to me that this sort of compassion is, it's understood intuitively. We sort of have an appreciation for um, why this compassion, why this sort of compassion is valuable and why it's the right thing to do. But we could never externally construct a system which says, I don't know, I mean, people try, but God, they're always such awful systems. Construct systems that say, oh, okay, quantitatively or even qualitatively, like here are the reasons to be altruistic. Here are the reasons to be a good person. Here are the reasons to provide something to someone less fortunate. Um, It is a, a strange circumstance that by way of a totally materialistic meditation practice, we can see this. And we can see it as a sort of fact, a sort of truth, where it's self-evident. We no longer need to construct an argument for ourselves. We no longer need to have the debate Oh, okay, there's an, I'm driving through the streets of Bangalore and there's an old woman begging on the side of the road. Do I give her money or not? Of course I do. I don't think about it. I don't debate where that money is going, how it's going to be used. Um, the amount of money she's asking for is negligible in my life. And for me to go through this process of debate is entering into rather silly structure of trying to look for answers which simply aren't there. And this is, of course, not to dissuade people from coming up with larger, more intelligent schemes for assisting the poor to um, go through the randomized control trials, um, which the authors of this book happen to advocate for. Um, but a person is more likely to understand the human reasons for doing those things rather than the mathematical reasons for doing those things um, through a meditative practice. And there's no real way to convince someone else of that. <laughs> um, it simply needs to be observed, but it does seem, does seem to be true. So. With that in mind, I don't recommend reading this book, <laughs> um, but uh, I suppose arguments are welcome if you wanted to read it and then tell me why perhaps I'm, I'm wrong in my analysis. Um, I hope that everyone is taking good care of themselves, doing well and staying healthy, and I hope that you're taking good care of everyone around you. I will talk to you tomorrow. Goodbye.